On October 14, 1947, a small rocket-powered plane flown by a 24-year-old Air Force captain flew into history over the high desert of California, breaking what is known as the sound barrier for the first time. Now there are plenty of documentaries on the subject already made by much more informed and capable creators out there, but I wanted to give you a relatively short rundown of Chuck Yeager's famous flight into history. Before we can delve into that October day, we need to understand why the effort was needed. It's been known for a long time that sound travels via air particles similar to waves in water. If you've ever seen a firework from a long distance, you'll notice there's a delay in what you see versus when you hear it. That's because sound travels much slower than what we visually perceive. But how fast does sound travel? A physicist by the name of Ernst Mach developed a formula in 1887 just to measure that. I've always sucked with math, so you're better off looking at that part up on your own, but Mach's formula was dubbed the Mach number, with Mach 1 equaling the speed of sound. Generally speaking, the speed of sound at sea level is approximately 760 miles per hour. Now you're probably thinking, oh, but Falcon, what do you mean approximately? So Mach 1 is not a fixed number. As air gets thinner based on altitude and other atmospheric influences, the speed of sound decreases. A good way to look at it is the higher you go, the slower sound travels until you get to space where there's no air and thus there's no sound. So great, cool, we know what the speed of sound is, but what stops an object from going past it? Now here's where we run into problems. Remember how I mentioned that sound moves in a similar fashion to water waves? When an object, say a plane, approaches Mach 1, those waves tend to slap back onto it. For most planes, those shockwaves slam into control surfaces, uh, i.e. things that allow you to go up, down, left, right, etc. You know, the important things. This became a huge problem in World War II when fast fighters would end up in steep dives and get control locked. If the pilot couldn't slow down, uh, the plane was likely to break up in midair if not just slam into the ground. It's not very cash money for aircraft developers who always aim for faster flying birds. No matter what was done, the problem persisted. And even when jet technology was developed, new fighters like the P-80 encountered what was eventually dubbed the sound barrier. As early as December 1944, the US Army Air Corps and the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, also known as NACA, decided it had to be broken. As World War II drew to a close, the Army Air Corps ordered the development of a small rocket-powered research plane. By 1946, the Bell Aircraft Company in Buffalo, New York go Bills, had developed the XS-1, which was shaped like a 50 caliber bullet and stuffed from nose to tail with fuel and research equipment. The XS-1, later renamed X-1, could take off from the ground, but with only a 2 minute and 30 second flight time, was made to fit in the bomb bay of a B-29 Superfortress. Once at 22,000 feet, the X-1 would be dropped from the bomb shackles and burst off in a rocket-powered climb to 40,000 feet. After that, it would level off, and a little orange plane would then move to break the sound barrier. But what about the shockwaves freezing the controls I brought up earlier? It was discovered that an all-moving tail, known as an adjustable horizontal stabilizer, would remain effective under the onslaught of shockwaves and should allow the pilot to maintain pitch control. But that was yet to be proven. And there's a bit of drama involving the NACA and the Air Force over the program, which I really encourage you to look into, but by 1947, the X-1 was sent to Muroc Airfield in California, a small base commanded by Colonel Albert Boyd, who was charged with assigning a pilot to the X-1. No small feat given the task at hand. So who would it be? The man for the job was none other than Captain Chuck Yeager, who at the age of 24 already had an amazing resume in the field. In World War II, Yeager downed 10 aircraft, 5 of them in a single day. This is even after he had been shot down in early 1944, evaded capture by the Germans, and with the help of French resistance fighters, made it back to Allied lines and begged to be put back in the air. Hell, this guy even shot down one of the early German jet fighters, the ME-262. This guy was a badass. After the war, he was assigned to Muroc to test captured German aircraft in addition to experimental US-built jets. It's almost as though he was tailor-made to fly the X-1. 
by October 14th of 1947, after multiple test flights in the X-1 that proved the all-moving tail would maintain control, the little orange plane was hoisted once more into the B-29 flown by Roberto Cardenas, with flight engineer Jack Ridley in the jump seat. Jaeger was ready to climb into the X-1 as he had done so frequently, but this time there was a problem. So two nights before, Jaeger and his wife Glennis had finished dinner at Poncho's, a popular bar and horse ranch owned by famed aviatrix Poncho Barnes. Why not go for a little horse ride? The two decided, no problem. All was well until Chuck's horse ran him into a gate which threw him to the ground and broke a pair of ribs. Awesome. Jaeger decided he absolutely could not tell anyone about the accident, lest he lose the X-1 and he decided to go to a local veterinarian instead of an actual people doctor. The problem now is that due to having a literal broken bone in his body, Chuck couldn't properly lock the X-1's hatch. Eh, that is until Jack Ridley came to the rescue with an advanced solution. A broom handle. Yeah. And once inside the X-1, he was able to lash the door shut. Just jammed it into the mechanism and uh, lashed it shut. Cool. Problem solved. Fast forward to 22,000 feet. After a countdown from three, the X-1 was dropped into the blue California sky once more. And like every time before, the rockets were lit, the plane climbed to 40,000 feet and started accelerating. This time, the X-1 reached Mach 0.98, faster than it had been yet. The aircraft vibrated as the supersonic shockwaves wrapped against the tail, and then... The Mach meter in Jaeger's cockpit jumped. A telltale sonic boom echoed across the desert. A result of the plane passing through its own shockwave and the resulting vacuum in its wake slapping shut like a massive bubble. Jaeger and the rest of the X-1 team had done it. The sound barrier was broken. DW read to headquarters. Sound barrier broken. What's my next mission, General? Not only did the U.S. Air Force now possess the knowledge necessary to safely pass through the sound barrier, it had the technology. Unfortunately for the aviation media crowd, it wasn't until 1948 that the U.S. admitted to having gone supersonic, as there was concern the new foe, the Soviet Union, would try to get their commie mitts on the data. The concern was well founded too, as the Soviets were developing high-speed aircraft of their own. The now proven all-moving tail was adapted for use on the F-86 Sabre, which later gave it an edge over the Soviet-built MiG-15s when maneuvering at high speed in the Korean War. In addition, the all-moving tail, redubbed the Stabilator, became standard on all high-performance aircraft as they were developed. In a few short years, the idea of a sound barrier had been extinguished. The demon that was ripping planes out of the sky had been beaten by the knowledge and courage of man. Sonic booms became routine over the California desert, and if you go out there today, you might just hear one yourself. Well, that's all for today. If you're interested in reading more on the subject, I highly recommend Chasing the Demon by Dan Hampton. It's a fantastic book which goes more into detail in the history of the program and other distinguished men involved. I just want to give a shout out to my wingman Hellion, who was kind enough to lend art to this project. You guys just have to check out his Patreon, Hellion Manor. You can find a link to it in the description below. And by the way, I'm always looking to learn too, so if you think I might have made an error or something, let me know in the comments. You already know the drill about liking and subscribing, so I won't waste your time on that. And remember guys, keep the sun at your back.